You're back soon. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just giving my pothos some bright and direct light. I'm watering it now. It's in a closet. There are slats. I don't need them anyways. Hello, my name is Nick and I spent like an hour and a half on the intro, so you should like the video. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about global warming. I wish it's freezing here. We're just gonna disregard what I just said. We are not talking about global warming, but we are talking about what level of light you should give your houseplants. Since I've been in this community, almost every source says that you should give pretty much all houseplants bright and direct light. Sometimes this is circulated by hobbyists that don't know any better, and other times it's circulated by companies that know better and do not grow their plants under bright and direct sunlight, but say it anyways. Now, why might companies do this? I have two reasons. One is people like to use their plants as home decor. There are even plants that are sold in big box stores that are listed as beautiful home decor. They don't even have a name listed on them. Unfortunately, you cannot call and ask if they have it in stock just because it's listed under beautiful home decor. My friends call me beautiful home decor. I saw this a lot on Reddit when I was more active on that platform. People would be like, hey, like, what's this plant? There's no name on it. I like it, I just don't know what it is. So I don't really know how to care for it other than the little tag that tells me to put it in bright and direct light. People want things they can put on their shelves, on their desks, next to their couch, in their closet. Nobody that's looking for aesthetics wants to crowd a bunch of plants around their window. But companies will not put, grows much faster with some direct sunlight However, we'll tolerate low light and maybe grow a little bit, probably stagnate until you move it into more intense light. It just doesn't sound good, so companies will say it thrives in bright and direct light, which most people don't know what that is, so they'll assume it's wherever they want to put the plant, or they'll say it thrives in low light. I'm not going to go into what bright and direct light is. Generally, in my opinion, it's the light you get from a north window if your plants are right in the north window, or if it's by a window that faces any other direction, but the light doesn't actually hit it. Again, bright and direct light is not in your shadow box next to your sea glass and pine cones in your windowless room. And you know what? Some people don't want to hear this. They want to think that their rabbit's foot fern is doing its best in the dishwasher. The second reason is people that are new to the hobby going and putting their plants that have been sitting in a store or have been shipped in a box directly into very intense sunlight, especially if it's outside. If this happens, they will burn and the customers will be mad. You know what, give me a manager. Manager. Right so moral of the story, just say bright and direct sunlight. Also, if people have expensive plants, like those splashy Hoyas that actually do appreciate direct sunlight, people would be mad if they burned them. If someone tells you that Hoyas thrive in low light or bright and direct sunlight, they're lying. Of course, I don't own all Hoyas, but out of the 30 plus Hoyas that I have, absolutely every single one of them has benefited from direct sunlight or a grow light. That brings me to this magazine that will be blurred out. It's got very confidential information. Actually, I just don't want to be sued for all the money I don't have. 25, 26, 27. Ooh, quarter. Ooh. On the front of this magazine is a picture of a flower of a Hoya pubicalix royal Hawaiian purple. Now, if you want Hoyas to flower, not just grow, they need a lot of light. Let's see what the care instructions say. Royal Hawaiian Purple is an enduring plant that thrives in low light and is considered to be an indestructible houseplant. I'm not really sure what that means. We'll just pretend we didn't read that. It landed in the shrub. <laughs> 
The funny thing is I got this shrub from this place. Anyways, as far as indestructible houseplant, Hoyas are pretty easy to destroy. Just overwater them. Plant them in a really poorly draining soil. You got a dead Hoya right there. Real easy. I actually possess one right here. I can tell you that this is not a low light plant. I got this over the summer. It grew for me a couple leaves when it was establishing. And basically from October to, well, pretty much the middle of February when it was dark out, it did nothing. And it was in a Western window, right in the window, on the windowsill, getting whatever direct light it could at that time of this year. It did not do anything until mid-February, until the day length increased, and we got a couple leaves, but again, it's not doing anything crazy. I have other Hoyas, like Hoya Linearis, that actually grew throughout the whole winter for me, but again, it was in a western window. I'm assuming you want your plants to grow fast, especially the more expensive ones. That way, you can propagate them and trade them for other expensive plants, or sell them. I'm also aware that you may fear burning them. I'm now going to talk about topics like UV radiation and plant structure so you can avoid this while still reaping the benefits of having a very fast growing plant. The first will be growth habits and what this tells you about the plant's sun requirements regardless of what you may have heard. I'm not going to go over every single individual plant, it'll be more of an intuitive thing. The next is UV radiation and how plants respond to this. That way, you can look at your plant and see what it wants based on what's going on in front of you. So those were one and two. The third is determining how intense your sunlight is based on where you are, and this is taking into account more than just the window direction and proximity to the equator because there are others that people don't really think about. The fourth is how windows change the amount of UV radiation coming into your house, and this does affect your plants. The fifth is me showing you some fantastic successes that I have had growing plants in direct sunlight, a lot of direct sunlight, when people have told me that they were low or indirect sunlight plants. I will put some timestamps in so you can go to wherever you want. Let's talk about plant structures. The first is the epiphyte. Now, why do epiphytes exist? No, not to look nice on your wall mounts. Epiphytes traded having their roots in soil, which is generally an ideal environment for a plant, for increased sunlight. It is not ideal whatsoever to have your root system exposed to the elements. So apparently, this trade-off was worth it. It also makes it very difficult for these plants to get water because when it stops raining, the roots dry out. Therefore, like orchids, they tend to grow very slowly. I give all of my orchids direct sun. I don't own any of those tiny, delicate, cloud foresty orchids. Those might be different, but again, I'm talking about general houseplants that you would find at a store. This is a small exception because people generally don't grow or sell these. You have to go to very specific places to find them. They also have to go into some type of enclosure or terrarium and you never put a terrarium in direct sunlight, so <laughs> that's out of the question. I have concluded, in my experience, most epiphytes do like some portion of direct sunlight. Next is vining plants. Now, why do vines exist? No, not to look good on that 3D printed trellis you found on Instagram. It is to reach towards the sunlight, invariably. Here is my Hoya Australis Lisa, and I don't know if you can see, but it's just, it's trying to grasp onto things and climb onto them and uh, reach towards the sunlight. So that's what that's for. These are loving direct sunlight in a western window, and we're in a southern window during the summer. No screen, by the way. Trees, fiddly figs, other types of ficus, bird of paradise, umbrella trees. They will tolerate low light, but naturally, they grow out in the open. These plants tolerate low light because usually for some portion of their life, they have to compete with other plants and live in kind of shady conditions. If your plant is semi-succulent and it has thickened leaves like a Hoya or a snake plant 
or structures like a tuberous root system in the ZZ plant and these expanded stem bases in order to hold water, it probably likes direct sunlight. Generally, if water is scarce in the natural habitat, that means there's not a lot of vegetation cover because the rainfall is just not sufficient enough for it. So most plants do prefer a decent amount of sun. The only exception that I really have where direct sun in almost any amount wouldn't really be that beneficial is if it's a plant that's native to a very wet area like a rainforest that lives on the forest floor meaning it doesn't have any vining or woody structure to it. Generally, these are things like peace lilies or aglaonemas. I have an aglaonema firecracker cutting right here. As you can see, there's no adaptation to any drought tolerance. The leaves are pretty thin. They don't vine. They are not woody. They're not really trying to go towards the sun. They've pretty much accepted. I live in the understory and that's where I'm happy. I do believe that bright and direct sunlight can be very beneficial to the plants, like real bright and direct sunlight in a north window or by any other window. And I think it's important to approach this intuitively. That way you're not boxed into instructions if they're not working for you. And I think knowing why you do things the way you do for a plant is very helpful. We will now talk about light and how it relates to burning plants, both visible light and UV light, and also how both types of light affect plants indoors and outdoors. Let's talk about windows because the light has to pass through those. And let's also talk about UVA light and UVB light. A regular glass window will block almost all UVB light, but only about 25% of UVA light. So what exactly does this mean? In order to understand this, we need to know what parts of ultraviolet radiation do. UVB light is responsible for sunburn in us. I couldn't find anything specifically on it for plants, but I would assume that's also what it causes in plants. It is a shorter wavelength and more intense light. The 75% of UVA light that is coming through the windows is not as intense. It's a longer wavelength and it's responsible for things like cellular mutations, so skin cancer. Plants, for the most part, because they've evolved to live in the sun, are generally very good at repairing genetic damage. Therefore, the UVA light shouldn't really be much of an issue. Now, what is a problem is visible light. Right now, visible light isn't doing anything to me. I have a ring light behind me and a floor lamp. If I put my face to one of the bulbs, it would be a problem. So it's not really the light, but it's the heat created by the light that burns plants. This is an issue because generally there's no wind in people's houses. This has only happened to me once in an unair conditioned room in the middle of summer where it got into the upper 80s and 90s and the sun was streaming in on one of my Hoyas. The combination of the temperature, no air movement, and the sun heated up a portion of a leaf that was particularly exposed and, you know, fried it. If your plants are indoors in the middle of summer without air conditioning, then yes, you have to worry about burning. Otherwise, not so much. Outside is different, and unless you live in a really, really hot climate, usually thermal burns aren't really an issue, but you will get sunburn from those UVB rays that are not being blocked by a window. Plants do have natural sunscreen called carotenoids and anthocyanins. Uh, they are pigments, kind of like we have melanin. Comparing plants to humans, we do not get tan unless we go in the sun. Plants do not get tan. They don't produce those pigments, those anthocyanins and carotenoids, unless they go out in the sun. If I was to go out and lay in the sun for 10 hours, it wouldn't really be a tan. I would be shedding. However, if I started you know, gradually, and then I worked up and I built up a tan. Eventually I would get to the position where I could go outside for a reasonable duration of time and not burn. 
that is the same as how plants work. From an evolutionary perspective, a plant is not going to produce these, they're called secondary metabolites, if they do not need them because it's a waste of energy. Moving on, how do you know when your plant is tanned or when it's built up its sunscreen? Sometimes you can't because chlorophyll pretty much completely masks it. A beautiful example of this is our fall foliage for those lucky enough to live in a temperate climate and live through many months of misery until the leaves come out again. If you like winter, please don't talk to me about it. Those pigments were there all along. They just appeared when the leaves stopped producing chlorophyll in preparation to fall off the tree. The trees stop producing chlorophyll before the leaves fall off, again, because they want to conserve energy. Around my house, we have Boston ivy planted, and every year, the leaves turn the most beautiful colors. I have some pictures that I will insert, but it's just hard to believe those were always there. You just couldn't see them. The only plants in this community where we can see these anthocyanins and carotenoids are Hoyas. And not all Hoyas, but just the ones that sun stress. For everything else, you just have to transition things, usually over the period of a couple weeks. So that is that. The next topic is light intensity and how different variables change that based on your location. We all know about latitude as you go closer to the equator from the poles. The sun is higher in the sky, more direct, and more intense. Also, the sun is more consistent closer to the equator, so 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness generally. Where I am closer to the pole, I have no problem growing my plants in the summer. When daylight hours get much shorter in the winter, most of my plants stop growing. So if that's an issue, I would highly recommend you invest in some cheap grow lights for your plants that you're trying to get larger. I will link the non-sponsored ones I am using above. The amount of cloud cover is also very important. Take Boise, Idaho, for example. On average, it gets 2,993 hours of sunshine a year, while Syracuse, New York gets an average of 2,119 hours of sunshine a year. Both cities are at 43 degrees north latitude. However, Boise gets 30% more sunshine than Syracuse, New York in a given year. Beyond basic care instruction, I think it's helpful to choose where you put your plant based on what your plant looks like, such as adulation or lack of growth if the light is too low, or yellowing, brown tips, and spotting if the light is too high. Elevation is probably one people really don't think about. The more you go up in elevation, the thinner the atmosphere is, and the more UV light can penetrate. Therefore, it's a lot easier to burn your plants. Places like Quito, Ecuador have some of the most intense UV radiation in the world. Why? It's right on the equator and it's also 10,000 feet in elevation. I have a picture of cacti growing under some trees and they look like they're doing pretty good. Also, it looks like there's an agave in the background, which is also another sun-loving succulent. I have several Hoyas that I put out in afternoon sun here. It was fine. I wouldn't, it probably wouldn't fly in Quito. The UV in the Andes is so intense, in fact, that the cacti grow hair to protect themselves. The pigments are not enough. In the picture I'm showing you, there's also a massive white salt pan, so that's probably <laughs> contributing to even more UV radiation. So if you live next to a salt pan, make sure you take that into account. I'll two of you. I had one of those old man cactuses. It did not do well because it's overcast here in the winter and we're pretty far north. So my solution to it was like, let's just take the hair off. I didn't think shaving it would work very well because all the thorns would get in the way. So I just lit it on fire. And guess what? It worked. It, did, it didn't hurt the cactus, actually. Just It was just like, and the hair was gone. So if you're ever looking for a safe hair removal method, just burn it off. It's ultimately very, I'm not responsible for anyone burning themselves alive. Thank you. If you wanted to know exactly where that image was taken, it was taken at the Uni salt pans in Bolivia. It is also a place where white people fly 5,000 miles to take ironic photos on reflective land. I have some photos for you. You can you can look them up. You can Google search it. 
you will not find one person of color. <laughs> Only white people do this. Here are the people that math books mention in their really obscure geometry questions. Now that we're done making a hexagon, let's get that keychain and get back on our 40 hour flight to Michigan. Next, we are going to determine the amount of sun that plants want. Generally, I prioritize my plants and give the ones that need the sun based on their structures and what I've heard the most sunlight and just arrange the rest from there. However, it is possible to give your plant too much light and it might not even burn. If you have a plant that's not a Hoya or a succulent or doesn't usually sun stress, if you see the leaf color changing or the leaf getting lighter, it might be too much sun. I have a picture of a leaf of my philodendron micans on Instagram. I gave it a little bit too much sun and it started to change color and that's not really good for it but everyone in the comments was like how did you do that i want to do it and i'm like don't do it <laughs> i probably shouldn't have posted it if the leaf color starts changing on your philodendron in pothos probably it's too much light and it's different from burning it's usually just a physiological response of the plant to say there's so much light i don't need that much chlorophyll the problem with this is when it goes back into lower light conditions, it doesn't have a lot of chlorophyll and you want it to have chlorophyll. So the leaves on your plants should stay the same color. They should stay dark green if they are originally dark green. That's about it for this lesson. I am next going to show you some of my successes of giving my plants the most amount of light possible that I can give them. Why don't we start out with my ZZ Raven? Here it is. Um, it needs to be dusted because it's been sitting around all winter. Tip, ZZ Ravens get really dusty, but they have all these leaves and rows and stuff and they're hard to wipe down. So I just kind of like, don't tell me it didn't work though. Ready, ready, wait, wait. My plants love me. A lot of people tell me they have trouble with these growing. I just think this black pigment on it just makes it so it can't absorb so much sunlight. If your ZZ Raven plant is not growing in your washing machine, maybe put it in a window. I love this though, and it grew for me these huge two stalks in the summer. I know that it likes it in the summer, I'm assuming, because there's lots of sun. I forgot to tell you where I had this. This was in one of the windows in this room. It was a Western window. That was during winter and spring of last year. It did nothing for me. After that, I put it on a porch. It was getting afternoon sun because it was in a Western window. Loved it, sent out these two gigantic stalks. As for this past winter, it's been in a Southern window, but it really hasn't been doing much for me besides this, but it's March now and this stalk right here. Here is my Cebu Blue. Look at that blue, silvery pigmentation. So pigmented. This is why it's called a Cebu Blue. This is it, there she is. Is that blue enough for you? This I got in a trade. It was a couple lanky stems. Since then it was on that porch, I think in Western Exposure and also Western Exposure indoors. It is extremely happy. I've tucked the vines in and out of the soil in order to create a more full plant and I've been snipping them once they've rooted and I see all sorts of shoots on it. So I'm very happy with this and it really likes the direct sun. Also note, including my ZZ Raven, a lot of these pigments that we find very desirable in these plants that we see on Instagram are caused by sun exposure. Therefore, if this wasn't getting any direct sun, I don't think this blue silvery pigment would really show on it. I see a lot of pictures of them and they're very green and it actually put me off from getting one for a while just because I was like, well, like is Instagram versus reality, like what's going on? Give your Cebu blue direct sun if you want silvery blue pigment. This Syngonium podophyllum albo, it's been growing crazy for me even through the winter. I'd also like to make a point with this one. Variegated plants are going to need more light 
to thrive and grow and do well than their non-variegated counterparts. Most people know that the white regions do not photosynthesize, they don't create energy for the plant. However, some people don't know that these regions, because they're living, are borrowing energy and nutrients from the green parts. So not only are the green parts responsible for the plant's growth, but they are responsible to keep their tissues alive and then this parasitic white tissue. I got this plant last year. I did an unboxing. It came as a big long stem. I chopped it up and this was the end of the stem. There were a couple leaves on it, but it did not look like this whatsoever. I don't think the leaves that were on there are even on here anymore. This was also on that hot porch and I think it was in a western window, and it's been in a western window all winter and doing fabulously. I had to adjust the camera for these ones to capture their full glory. We are going to start with my love, my pride and joy, Peperomia macrostachia. This plant is kind of a hot mess, very difficult to control, kind of unstable, and it's very clingy but seriously this plant grows so fast i leave it for like two days and it's climbing into the blinds it's climbing into the molding on the walls it's climbing onto other plants this started from a relatively small cutting i got last year in a trade form now i wasn't even looking for this i didn't even know this existed but now that i do i need it i grew it on my porch with everything because most of these plants are tropical. It grew very quickly. Then I moved it inside and put it in a western window. So it's been getting direct sunlight and this has grown all throughout the window. I'm sure this plant could handle lower light conditions well, but I don't really want to do that because I want it to get as big as possible. If there was any plant in my collection that I would let strangle me and use me for fertilizer, it would be this plant. I'm sure at some point it probably will. Lastly, our Hoya Australis Lisas. Lisa. Liz Anya. That's, that's Liz Anya. I got these last year, I think around June. They were together in a four inch pot. I separated them. They still have anxiety from it, but they'll get over it. Anyways, these have just grown crazy fast. They were on that porch, southern window. And one of these I have in a southern window, this one, and then I have this one in a western window. They stopped growing in the middle of winter, but they have since resumed, and I'm very happy with them. So that is it, everyone. Like the video if you learned something from this. You should definitely subscribe. Uh, I won't spam you with Golden Pothos unboxings. And leave a comment. Um, any comment is fine, really. I accept them all. And also a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon. We just put you right here, keep you away from that big bad sun. Yes. Bye.